Okay, everybody, we need you to help out. We got folks looking for seats. If you got a couple, wave at them and, uh, and make room. There's some up here by Shell. Hey, right up here on the second row, you'll be able to hear me there. Yep, bring an umbrella. <laughs> yeah, Luke said bring an umbrella. I don't know what that means, but that's what he, yeah, I, 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 have, no ref, I have no reference on that. They haven't started the live stream, have they? <laughs> have they? Oh, gosh. Oh, well. Everybody on live stream, we love you.
In 2006, the Detroit Lions hired two veteran quarterbacks, John Kitten and some guy named Josh McCowan, to come in and compete for their starting job. And they had a young quarterback on staff named Dan Orlovsky. And you got to know how competition is in the NFL. You don't help your guy that you're competing against. I've heard stories about quarterbacks giving the other quarterbacks wrong meeting times, wrong notes, a bunch of stuff. John and Josh were fast friends competing. They don't have one on the team. And they competed for the same job with love and friendship. And this young quarterback watched and couldn't figure out what was going on. And he said, how can you, how, what's going on with you guys? Y'all are happy and content all the time. And they told him. And through the next week or two, in conversation and in conversation with John and with, with Josh, he, he kind of figured it out. And in the locker room before the Chicago Bears played the Green Bay Packers, he knelt by his locker. <laughs> and prayed the prayer. And see, we don't see that by the NFL all the time. And that was 16 years ago. And I told Josh when I was talking about him, 16 years ago, Josh saw about three days ago when a young reporter in front of millions of people did what we never do. We say, I'll pray for you. We never do. And he said, we ought to pray for this player that's been hurt. He said, I think I will. And so in front of millions of people, he, he explained God in 30 seconds. Dan won't live long enough to impact that many people in his life that that 30 seconds did. So I want you to know, you know, it's not Tony Evans or Pastor Jeffries. It's not the big people that talk to God. It's us. It's all of us. And so, and so see this in the light of this wasn't a seminary student. This wasn't a, a, a pastor of a mega church. This is just a third-team quarterback that got a job with ESPN, and he can talk pretty good. Just watch this. You know, like, this is a little bit different. I heard, I've heard it all day, like, thoughts and prayers. And you just heard Scherf and Jonathan Allen say, like, all we can do is pray for him. And I've heard the Buffalo Bills organization say, like, we believe in prayer. And maybe this is not the right thing to do, but I want it's just on my heart that I want to pray for It him. is. Damar Hamlin, right, right, right now. Um, I'm going to do it out loud. I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to bow my head, and I'm just going to pray for him. Um, God, we come to you in these moments that we don't understand, that are hard. Uh, because we believe that your God and coming to you and praying to you um, has impact. We're, we're sad, we're angry, um, and we want answers, but some things are unanswerable. We just want to pray, truly come to you and pray for strength for Damar, for healing for Damar, for comfort for Damar, to be with his family, to give them peace, if we didn't believe that prayer didn't work, we wouldn't ask this of you, God. Um, I believe in prayer. We believe in prayer. We lift up Damar Hamlin's name in your name. Amen. 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 You know, like, this is a... I knew most of you had seen that, but we wanted to show it for a couple of reasons. Number one, you might not have known the story that there was a Jacksonville connection there. Uh, and praise the Lord for it. Um, and uh, thankful for these men like Josh and Luke uh, who had impact. Uh, people that had spiritual impact in their lives like Benjamin Watson. And then the impact they had in others. Um, but what I really wanted was I wanted you to see how this fits our, our uh, campaign the next six weeks. This isn't let's talk about prayer. This is let's pray. Amen. Let's do it. Um, there's a prayer room next door that's going to be open office hours. <coughs> Ladies, on Sunday mornings, there will be a group meeting in there at 815. 
We're gonna we're talking about when we can get men here because they're not as dedicated, and uh, and so we're we're looking into what that might look like, uh, but. We want this time to be a time we pray. I like what Bill said in the connection group this morning. This isn't about education. This is about experiencing the presence of God and actually praying. God bless Dan, amen, Amen. for that courage and that willingness to say, I just just think we all pray. And when we have that nudge of the Holy Spirit, um, we need to do it. I was handed a note by Christy, her dad, and Jason's, and, and Leanne's, and uh, your sister, huh? Melissa, that was it. Uh, and, uh, but their dad is at Heaven's Doorstep right now, Buddy Price. And uh, Christy has asked me and was telling me just how, when she handed it to me, I had to go back and get some info. I was like, wait a minute. Uh, and she was just saying this has progressed really, really quick uh, here recently. But it's in a hospice center, is that what you told me? Legacy and hospice is in charge of it. So we want to pray for this family and lift them up. So let's stop. Father, we come to you at this time not saying we need to pray. We want to pray. We want to cry out. God, all these uh, people in here, and you can hear every one of our hearts at the same exact moment and hear us, and, and know it's your child, and we cry out to you, God, send revival. Send your presence in such an awesome, powerful way that we know it's you, and you're on the move, and only you can get all the honor, glory, and praise. Thank you for this young man. Thank you for men who spoke into his life, and he gave his, his life to you and put his faith and trust in you as a Savior for such a time as you used him this last week. So God, I pray that this prayer with no intermission would drive us to our knees, in our hearts, to cry out to you more, to pray more, and to dramatically increase our intimacy with you. Father, we lift up Buddy Price to you. We lift up this sweet family. Father, it honestly just really caught me off guard. And, uh, but it hasn't you. God, you're fully aware. You know the situation. So be with this sweet, sweet family and minister to them and be with him as he takes this step into eternity. Father, now we want to worship you and praise you in a way that is worthy of your name. And I want us to do that with great joy, with our our voices lifted high and our hearts and our spiritual eyes looking to you. And I ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together. All right. Turn to the person next to you and say, hey, good to see you. All right. Let's worship together. This is amazing grace. One, two, three, four.
for me.
You're my Prince of Peace, and I will live my life for you. Let's sing, Oh, how I love Jesus. There is a name I love to give.
mic on. Sorry. You want me to do that again? So I want to have a grand... No, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I apologize uh, to everybody out there uh, that was listening. Uh, you should have been here and you'd have heard it. But anyway... Uh, Wow. Hey, let me speak to a couple of things. First of all, if you didn't get a bulletin, get one. It's got the outline in there, and I'd love for you to uh, have that outline so that you can follow along here in a couple of moments uh, and be aware of it. But I really want to speak to you about our 40 days for just a second. Dramatically increase your intimacy with God. Uh, Bill Eliff is the author of this. He's a personal friend, which I, ha, has really only happened in the last, oh, I don't know, about 10 years when I met Bill. Uh, but uh, even Branson said to me, he said, kind of a Henry Blackaby type, and I agree. Man, this guy walks with the Lord, uh, loves the Lord, knows Blackaby by, uh, by chance also, and that mic's got to go. Uh, and... Uh, and so I just want to speak to you the best way to get the most out of this campaign. Six weeks, okay? We're going to focus on prayer. Wednesday nights, the Ericsons are teaching out of Bill's book on simply prayer and giving them the six A's of the Lord's Prayer. And, uh, and I'm loving that. And so we're just tying it all together. But the best way to get the most out of this, first of all, be here. But secondly, get the book. Don't let the money get in the way. I want you to have a book. This church will cover it. If you're able to help, that's great. If you're not, get you a book. Did I make that clear? Now, one other thing. Dwayne's wrong. It did not start last Monday. It starts tomorrow. If you'll just accept Dwayne's wrong, that'll help you most of the time in your life. Amen. <laughs> if you'll just realize, you know, and I told a couple ladies, I said, well, you should have known better. Well, they said, well, we told him, uh, and well, we were explaining, but I understand why. We started the soap schedule last Monday, and I... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's trying to recover, but there is no recovery. Uh, but the actual chapter, he said, well, I already started. That's okay. But I would suggest go back, start again. An extra week's not going to hurt you. And uh, here's the most important part. At the end of each chapter, and they're very short, literally take you four or five minutes tops to read them. But at the end, he gives you some steps on how to pray it in. That is huge. So the soap passages every day are for on prayer. Everything's focusing on this, how to have prayer with no intermission, how to have 40 days I'm unceasing prayer. And I know that challenges some of you because you're like, well, that's not possible. I can't be on my hands and knees. Listen to me. Prayer is not just talking to God. It's listening. And you know, we ought to listen a little more. And it's like, as I go through my day, am I watching where God is at work? Am I aware of how, what He wants me to do and how He wants me uh, to, to be involved and how important that is? So prayer is is huge as we dedicate ourselves. we got a lot to pray about. Would you not agree? Can I tell you all something? Isn't it wonderful to see the house full? Some of y'all sitting here today, I've been praying for you. I've missed you. So good to see you. I'm so glad you're here. I even went, y'all know me, I'm boom, 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 boom. I'm kind of like, some of y'all remember Ricochet Rabbit? I, I feel like him some days. I really do. Bing, bing, bing. But I even went by the overflows and said, man, so glad to see you guys. Both rooms. Uh, we've got folks. I won't say both are completely full because that would be a little bit of a stretch, but that's what preachers do, okay? So uh, every seat's taken at Cornerstone today, and that's not true, and you know it. But hear me. We are praying what next steps are going to be for this because uh, I'm praying this is the beginning of a real good problem, aren't you? And how we're going to handle it and what we're going to do with it. So, dramatically in this time, increase your intimacy with God. Then, 40 days of unceasing prayer. Prayer without ceasing. Would you stand for the reading 
of Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark. Some of y'all need me to read that again. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he, Jesus, got up, went out, and made his way to a deserted place. And he was praying there. Luke, I want you to do something for me. Come up here and pray. Y'all stay standing. Uh Uh-oh, this one's got a red light. Oh, it's working. There you go. Pray for us, Luke. It ain't dark outside, though, preacher. No, it's not, but go ahead. <laughs> Let's pray. Mm. Yes, Lord. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Father, your word tells us that that's what the angels are saying over and over and over again right right now. And if we could only peer into heaven... Would we be silent or would we too join in? Maybe we're struck with awe. Maybe the expectation of our heart is fulfilled for what we've always thought it would be. Nonetheless, God, we desire to know how to do that, what they do. Yes. How to commune with you. We're different. God, you've made us different. You've made our faith different from all the other false faiths out there throughout the world. We, we get to intervene, inter, inter, um, communicate right. with the creator of the world. That's right. And, and, it, and it doesn't have to, we don't have to have an object to pray to. We don't have to be in a certain setting. It doesn't have to be a certain time of day. God, teach us how to pray. We ask you like the disciples did. And when we don't know what to pray, Holy Spirit, come and pray for us. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Be glorified in this place. We rejoice always. I pray we learn how to pray without ceasing. And we're thankful for all you've done in our lives. We lift all this up in the magnificent name of the Holy One, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Just pray there if you would. You don't know, you may be seated, sorry. You don't know what just happened, but let me tell you what just happened. This morning in my office, I've been praying about this series, and I've been so excited about it. Guys, I can tell you it's taken me years to get to where I get up in the morning hungry for his presence. Years. It just doesn't happen overnight. You got you to gotta work at it, work at it, work at it. And you just got to keep leaning into it, leaning into it. And in my office this morning, I thought, you know, people need to hear more of our, of our people pray. Because uh, I know sometimes because of mics and live stream and all these things. And, and God just put Luke on my heart. And I got up here and I looked at the clock and I said, Lord, I don't have time for this. Isn't it funny how we do that? And I'm the leader. That's scary. (laughs) And uh, we need to pray more. We need to cry out to him more. So this idea of prayer with no intermission. Let me talk to you about the way God started this. He created Adam and Eve. And they were created to enjoy his company. Bill made reference to this in the video that we watched this morning in the connection group. And you know, back then it just didn't take a lot of effort. Sin wasn't around. The splendor of the garden, wow, 
You talk about vibrant, you talk about spectacular. I don't even think we totally understand how awesome it was, the richness of the, of the fruit, the unity of the animal king, lion and lamb, going off together and not thinking about lunch, and, and, and the brilliance of the sun and the coolness of the afternoon when God would show up and walk with man. Everything in the garden was made to nourish them. Everything. And everything was replenishing itself. Now, everybody hear me. This is out of the book of Barker. I got no theology to back this up, but I just wonder. When I picked an apple off of an apple tree, was one there immediately? Because I just think it was an unceasing replenishment of everything he gave them. There was an inexhaustible supply. Yet the best thing, the greatest thing, was their ability to walk with God. And God would come and meet with them and walk with them and talk with them. And I just imagine Adam and Eve being told by God, there's nothing I won't share with you. There's nothing I'm hiding from you. There's nothing that I won't provide for you. And by the way, when you don't see me, I'm always with you. And when you cry out to me with a request, I'll always hear it. I'm just a cry away. Now we know in that garden there were two trees, a tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now here's the crazy thing to me, folks. There was one rule. One. Let me make this clear. Not two, not three. One rule. Do not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Well, we know how that went. So they disobey, and now when God shows up in the coolness of day, he can't find them. Now, I probably didn't say that theologically correct because he knew exactly where they were, but they were missing. They were AWOL because they knew they had sinned and they had disobeyed God. Now, for our five points this morning, which will go real quick, I promise, I want you to look at, um, and I skipped over it, but I'll go on, Mark 1.35. Rising early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to desolate places, and there he prayed. Now, Psalm 37, 4, which I skipped over and didn't mean to, but oh well. It just talks about David saying, there's one thing, Lord, I desire. I long to be in your presence and to gaze upon your beauty and to seek you in your temple. Do you crave his presence like that? Do you long for intimacy with God the way it's described by David? Do you desire to see him and talk to him every day? Do you long to spend close, intimate time with him? So here's Jesus, gets up early, and I just like the terminology in the ESV. And don't freak out. I know I normally use uh, Holman Christian Standard, but I like sometimes the way different versions use a different descriptor, and it just sometimes makes it come alive. So let me use these words here. Here's your first point. It requires rising up. It requires a commitment on your part. you got to do something. You have a personal responsibility. He rose up very early in the morning while it was still dark. And how many times have you or I missed a moment with God 
simply because we would not get up. Some of y'all are sitting there. If I'd have known he was going to get on me for what time I get up in the morning, I wouldn't have come today. That's not the point. That is not the point. There's got to be a time you do rise up. There's got to be a moment every day that you do seek Him and long for Him and look for Him. How will you respond when God prompts your heart to experience communion and fellowship with Him? Y'all have heard me talk about Shelby and I when we've met, but I can remember one of the first times I said, Hey, uh, you know, we work together and our lunches overlap. How about if we just go get some lunch together? And I got to tell you, you talk about pray without ceasing. Please, 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 oh God. And she said yes. And I said, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I wanted to get to know her. It's that desire, it's that longing. Look at Proverbs chapter 6, verses 10 and 11. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief, and scarcity like an armed man. Now, I know the context of that passage, but does it not work as well in our intimacy and in our fellowship and our relationship? If we're lazy, it ain't going to happen. So here's the truth I want you to get out of number one. The love of comfort can abort your intimacy with God. It can just eject it. It can cause it not to happen because you're more interested in your comfort and what you're doing than in taking the time to spend with Him. Number two, it requires breaking away. Not only do you got to rise up, but you got to break away. He departed. Jesus was willing to leave the comfort and the security of the crowd. Everyone was looking for him. Everyone was, Jesus, what are you doing? Where are you going? But Jesus considered, watch, this is so important. He considered time with the Father more important than time with men. We struggle with that sometimes, don't we? Man, I got to talk to them and I got to straighten them out and I got to do this and I got to do this and I got to do this and I got to do that. And Jesus <laughs> saw talking with the Father as more important than talking to men. Jesus knew everything depended on his communion and fellowship with the Father. And he was willing to leave the familiar, the comfortable, the safe, the crowd and be alone. Can I tell you something? I don't do alone well. I am a people person. I energize being around folks. I energize seeing you guys. And I never forget, I, I hadn't been here long as pastor. And we were having a fellowship out in the gym. And I was going around like I like to do, table to table. And Byron comes to me and goes, Preacher, you ain't got to do that. You won the election. <laughs> And we were just, he and I were just having fun, but can I tell you something? People energize me. So therefore, it's difficult. But you know what I've learned? His presence is so much sweeter than the best of the people uh, fellowship that I so greatly enjoy. Listen to Luke chapter 2. Yet the news about him spread all the more, so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed, Boy, I'll tell you what, we'd have, been, have you heard how many we had on Tuesday night when Jesus was teaching? I bet we're going to, I mean, can you just imagine all of the, of the press that was going on about when Jesus showed up and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus got on TV to invite more people. Now, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Wow. Let me give you the truth. 
This is out of another book by Bill Elif, Essential Presence, where he says this, If you are never inaccessible, you usually have nothing to say when you are accessible. (laughs) Wow. Hearing his voice, having him speak, having him guide, having him direct, having him give us a word. Can I tell you, you're going to have to lean in and listen to that still, small voice. Number three, it requires solitude and seclusion. That's what he does. He went out. You need a place, a space of separation where it's uncluttered, where it's uninterrupted. Don't you ever think that geography is not important in your prayer time? you got to have a place. Not that it's a particular spot, but that it helps you to focus on Him. Jesus referred to a desolate place. Knowing that there is something, hear me, crucial about solitude. We got to be reminded of that. He went to a place where there was no noise. It's hard to find, isn't it? He retired to a desolate place knowing how crucial it was. Now why? He altered his environment to gain a greater capacity to hear him. To be Frank or Larry. Sorry, it's just a gift that many of you would like me to bury. (laughs) I was alone when he told me go to Cornerstone. I changed my environment. I went to a place I normally don't run. And I went out and I was arguing with God. God, what else? God, you no, I said it wrong. What God, you're just gonna have to show me. You're just, and I'll never forget when he went, What else do I need to show you? But I went somewhere I could get all the voices out except his. Here's what it says in that verse. Yet he often withdrew. How important that word is. He withdrew to deserted places and prayed. Desolate places. Lonely places. Here's the truth I want to share with you. I got this out of one of Mark Batterson's studies and I've used it ever since I ran across it. I love it. A change of place plus a change of pace equals a change of perspective. Can I tell you, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. After a hard day at work, you need a change of perspective, don't you? Absolutely. Or a difficult situation in your life. Sometimes you just got to break away and withdraw and get alone and talk to God and allow Him to minister to your soul as only He can. And that comes out of that solitude and seclusion. Number four. Prayer, intimacy, intentional intimacy with God, it requires talking with God. And some of y'all are going, well, duh. But can I tell you something about talking and communicating with God? He doesn't want us to talk about how we do it. He wants us to talk to Him. I was telling the, the class, uh, the fellowship class that I uh, was the connection group Uh, leader this morning and assisting them and helping them. I said, I have never met a Christian that looked me in the eye and said this, I just talk to God way too much. Would you pray for me? I've never had one individual say that to me. Yes, we can pray anytime, anywhere, but it says he prayed there. He prayed then. See, he was going somewhere and he was moving in a direction with a deliberate purpose in mind and he needed to talk to the Father. It was a distinct, deliberate choice to pray. 
I'm sorry I'm, I'm pulling out all the guns right now, and this might sound a little mean. The only reason you don't pray more is because you choose not to pray more. It's the only reason. Goes for me too. It's our choice. It is a deliberate leaning into him. He utilized his time when he arrived there. When he got to that secluded place, he didn't say, well, this is great and look at everything. No, the Bible says he prayed. He valued prayer so much that it took priority over fellowship with others and the comfort of an early morning bed. Uh, you can thank me for that one later. Can I ask you something? What would this moment say about you? If this story was you, well, Larry broke away. He went to that lonely, desert, desolate, deserted place. What would it say about me in the biblical account? And there Larry sat and thought, where is everybody? And why aren't they here? Or would it say, and Larry checked all his messages. Love you. Larry worked and labored and got his to-do list together for the day. Larry sat around and planned and thought through and organized what he would do next when he got back to where life was happening with real people. Not Jesus. Here's what it says about him. In those days, Jesus went out to the mountain to pray, and he spent the night in prayer to God. Please hear me. If you're sitting there thinking, I'm never going to get where he's talking about, don't let the devil lie to you. I'm not asking you to go from here light years forward in your prayer life. I'm asking you to take some baby steps. I'm asking you to do a little bit more. I'm asking you to expand. I'm asking you to walk towards Him. I'm asking you to talk with Him a little bit more and listen to Him a little bit more. And what does that look like in your life? But here's what you got to realize. The business of solitude was and is singular. I can pray for you, but nobody can talk to your father like you can. Nobody. Nobody. Let me give you number five. It requires silence and listening. You know, there's something about knowing God that comes in stillness and silence that can only come in stillness and silence. There's no other way. To hear it. There's no other way to know it. See, Jesus was dead to everything but the Father's will. You know why? He was regularly, consistent, consistently listening to the Father's heartbeat. Intentional silence in His presence. Turning loose and letting go of every attachment you have in this world. There are at least six times in the book of John, the Bible makes it very clear, Jesus would do nothing that the Father didn't tell him to do. But I think one of the best, and this is New American Standard, and the reason I picked it is I just love that word initiative. I can do nothing on my own initiative. By the way, this is Jesus, the Son of God, saying this. I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. For I do not seek my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. Bill calls this God-initiated. Because a mentor in his life by the name of Manly Beasley said this, The true worth of a man is determined by his willingness to do nothing that is not God-initiated. 
What a statement. What a challenge for our lives. So here's your truth before we wrap this up. We must learn how to retreat from the competing voices in order to hear His voice. So let me just ask you the questions from what we just talked about. Why did He rise early? Why did He break away from everyone else? Why was He seeking solitude and seclusion? Why did he determine to intentionally talk with his father? Well, number five answers it. He desired to listen to what the father had to say. And that requires a couple elements I'll give you in just a moment. I didn't intend on sharing this. But at the moment my dad was dying, he leaned over and said, come here. I got my ear real close to his voice. He gave me five words. Take care of your mother. Yes, sir. We'll do it. It just made me think, what did Jesus say to John? What a word. But I had to lean in close. He was so weak at that moment. He hadn't been awake in a couple of days. But he wanted to tell me, take care of your mom. Hear me. We did. We did what he said. That's why you need intimacy with the Father. You're leaning in that ear and you're saying, Father, what are your sealed orders for me that I can't get any other way? What do you have to say to me, Father, that I can't hear unless I get alone and I listen and I get still and I get all the competing voices out? What word do you have for me, Father? There's three primary ways you can listen to God. Through His Word, and let me say this, there is no more reliable voice on planet Earth than the Word of God. Nothing. Nothing. Matter of fact, I think sometimes he looks down and goes, what are you people arguing about? I told you what to do. Why are you debating it? There it is. The Scriptures. Then, silence and solitude. Where you can get all those voices out. And the third is surrender. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So let me give you these little things just to conclude. For you to think about this week as you go into these books and you seek Him and you take those baby steps, our leaps, whatever they may be, the intentional, deliberate choice to be in His presence. That's what intentionality of intimacy is all about. So you want to be aware You want to be appreciative, and you want to be attentive. Is that not intimacy? Be aware He is there, and you're in His presence. You may not always have goosebumps and the hair on the back of your neck may not always stand up and it may not be a God moment that where God shows up in such a powerful way you just want to tell everybody, but you still need to be there. I'll go back to my dad. I was not going to be out of that room when he stepped into heaven if I could help it. Now trust me, families, if you've been there, you can run down and get a drink at the water fountain and come back And God can call somebody home. So I didn't have that promise. Uh, I didn't. I was just thankful that he allowed it to happen. But I wanted to be aware. 
And I want to be aware, God, you are here. God, we're in your presence. God, you're doing a work. And I just want you to know, I know you're here. And so I want to be appreciative of your presence and what you're doing. And listen to your word and listen to the Holy Spirit and seek the wisdom of counsel of others. And God, I just want to be attentive to that because I know you've got a word for me. And I want everything I do in my life to be God-initiated. Somebody said to me the other day, they said, Brother Larry, we know you've been talking transition for some time. When's that going to happen? Hear me on this. When God says go, I'll go the same way he said go when I came. He hasn't said that crystal clear to me yet. Some of y'all are praying I'll listen a little harder. I get it. I get it. I understand. But can I tell you, I just want my life to be God-initiated. For him to lead every step, every way. I can't take credit for it then, can I? It's his hand. It's his voice. It's his direction. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this truth. I pray that that this would help us to follow in your steps that we would rise up and that we would break away and we would go out and and seek you in solitude and seclusion and that we would talk to you and we would listen to hear your voice, your speaking. We just got to get where all those competing voices are not there so that we can hear you clearly. And know that we have heard from Almighty God. And if your son sought you and wouldn't do anything on his own initiative, then, oh God, who are we to not pursue that same relationship? May this be a beginning of revival May this be the beginning of your manifest presence falling on our lives in a powerful way that when we look back, it's because we prayed and we cried out to you and you heard our cry and you responded. But God, we got to pray. So I ask you, hear this cry, hear this plea and respond as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand?